I want to begin today with the admission of a guilty secret, namely that uh, I'm a huge fan of two television series that are all about the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> I can't recall exactly how I got started into the series. Uh, I wouldn't normally give any show with a whiff of zombies the time of day, but somehow or other, I started watching The Walking Dead a few years ago, and, and more recently its prequel, Fear of the Walking Dead. If you don't know these shows, the scenario is, is pretty predictable. A virus has swept through the world's human population, and now anyone who dies, whether by accident or naturally, becomes a flesh-eating zombie in short order. And so civilization just collapses, and those few that remain who haven't yet been infected face a terrifying world. They're either on their own, which is usually a certain ticket to doom, or they survive in small groups. Now survivors have not only to avoid or kill those, the shuffling, growling zombies, they have to deal with the basics of human survival. Food, water, security. What makes this particularly compelling for me is that the survivors have to deal with some still more basic questions as well. What would I do in order to survive? How much is enough? Whom can I trust? What is the nature of community? Is it, is it just about kinship ties? Is it about common interests, about something else? What is a human life anyway? And so through it all, they're struggling to remember what is it to be a human being after all. Now, dystopian visions such as this tell us a lot about what we really fear. This becomes especially clear in the prequel, Fear the Walking Dead, where the virus starts among the people that we're really afraid of, that is, the poor, strangers, drug addicts. As with any good science fiction, these shows tell us a, as much about ourselves as they do about some imagined future. The imagined future is comment on our common present. Now, most Canadians have probably got some version of the myth that the first Thanksgiving dates back to Plymouth Rock and the arrival of the pilgrims there, the Pilgrim Fathers as they're called. In reality, the Canadian story starts some 40 years prior to the American story, um, and it actually comes with a bit of an Anglican twist. On July 22, 1578, the, Robert, the Reverend Robert Wolfall, chaplain to the third Frobisher expedition, celebrated the Eucharist on board the ship Judith. Edward Fenton, the, the ship's captain, noted in his journal, Tuesday, the 22nd day, we did receive the communion altogether, continuing that day in prayer and thanksgiving to God. The Book of Commemorations, which speaks of this um, celebration of the first Anglican Eucharist in Canada, goes on to say that Frobisher decided to give up the idea of establishing a permanent settlement on Baffin Island and took the entire fleet back to England in mid-September. Almost a century would pass before Anglicans again celebrated the Eucharist on Canadian soil. Now apparently following that first Eucharist, they had a rather humble meal of salt beef, rock-hard crackers, and mushy peas. That's all they had in their larder for the first Thanksgiving on what would become Canadian soil. It's just as well that never really took hold as our Thanksgiving fare. <laughs> now, Clearly, Frobisher and his company didn't face zombies or anything of the like on their short Arctic tour. So let's just be clear that Thanksgiving really begins not, no, neither begins nor ends either with the pilgrims nor with Frobisher's expedition. We just take a few moments this morning before we plunge into the turkey and the stuffing and the pumpkin pie and all the rest. If we pause to ponder those perennial questions, what would I do in order to survive? How much is enough? Whom can I trust? What is a human life anyway? That first reading this morning from Deuteronomy is one means of facing those questions. It begins with a litany of the good things of the earth, the riches of the land into which the people of God have been led. 
a good land, a land flowing with flowing streams, with springs and underground waters welling up in valleys and hills, a land of olive trees and honey, a land where you can eat bread without scarcity, where you will lack nothing, a land whose stones are iron and from whose hills you may mine copper. You shall eat your fill and bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Thanksgiving begins not with our success, not even with ourselves. It begins with God. We don't give thanks for the pilgrims or Martin Frobisher. Rather, we give thanks for the God whom they adored. That God to whom the first peoples of this land rendered praise, that God whom the people of Israel adored for their freedom, that God who has sustained all who have, for whom home and family and community and civilization have collapsed. Thanksgiving begins with God. We're thankful not only for God's constancy and for our place in God's plan, but if we're really to be part of the process of living a truly human life in a world that is still marred by great injustices, violence, and greed, we are most thankful that with God we are given yet another chance to remember. For in that passage from Deuteronomy, we are reminded over and over again, take care that you do not forget. Remember, remember, Remember it is the Lord your God, the one who freed you, the one who sustained you in your perilous journey, the one who has given you the fruitful earth, who gives you the power to get wealth. And it's in the remembering that thanks, out of the remembering that thanksgiving flows. And yet how often it seems we, we live as if we were suffering from some kind of amnesia. As consumers, we're, we're encouraged to be greedy, to identify our best good as getting more and more. In, in short, to forget that we've all, what we already have by being so caught up in a distant fantasy of what we do not yet have. But remembering teaches us to receive things and people as a gift, not a right. Remembering us teaches us to appreciate and to value what we already have, to be satisfied even with a very little. Just think of a child who at Christmas receives some wonderful present and just spends all the time playing with the box. You know what is said to be the most reproduced image of the 20th century? It's the view of Earth from outer space. And we've all seen it. That the earth floating like a great blue and white jewel on an ocean of darkness. And there are no divisions, no borders visible between nations or peoples. It shows us all there is for us, nothing else, this fragile earth, our island home. And now the question is, how do we honor that? Can we remember that? My home, our home, our children's home, our children's children's home. All this is ours just for the moment as a sheer gift. Scientists tell us that everything that exists in the universe came from a common origin, from that great gigantic fireball that exploded outwards a billion years, billions of years ago. And now the material of my body and your body are all intrinsically related because they emerged from and came out of that single event. Our ancestry stretches back through the life forms and into the stars, back to the beginnings. We don't face any zombie apocalypse, but the crises before us are great nonetheless. But we are the first generation to see this. We're the first humans to look up into the night sky and be able to see the birth of stars, the birth of galaxies, the birth of the cosmos as a home. So don't forget, remember. When we proclaim our faith together, we declare God to be the creator, the source, the origin of all things, visible and invisible. Everything that has been, everything that is, everything that ever will be, all these things are sustained by God, the giver of life. 
when we remember, when we really remember and are filled with the awe and wonder of it all, how fortunate we are as people of faith to know that there is one to whom we can give thanks. Today in this service, which is known by its Greek name, the service called The Thanksgiving, we've also heard of those ten lepers who were made well by Jesus. One of them returns to give thanks to Eucharistize, it says. And although all of them have been cleansed, it's only to this one that Jesus says, your faith has made you well. Or to translate it differently, your faith has saved you. The same word can be read both ways. Ten are healed, one is saved. We too may return today to give thanks for what we have been given Remembering, we find that we've also been returned to a right relationship with the God who loves us. So loves us that when we bring our simple gifts to the altar, they're given back to us, transformed, renewed, so that with God we may share abundantly in every good work, we who have received the surpassing grace of God. God is, we are, in spite of our fumbles and because of God's grace, we need not fear the stranger or the other, neither the troubles of this age, nor yet do we need to fear what is still to come. We do not bless God for our wealth, our health, or for our feeble wisdom. We bless God that God is, that we are, and that God's promise and love shall be with us when time itself shall be no more.